Father God, I just thank you so much for Jesus. He is the living word of God. I love your word. Did anybody see Kenneth Copeland on Sid Roth at Supernatural? Oh, it was so different because Sid Roth loves the supernatural, loves the whoo out there stuff, you know. And Kenneth Copeland's got there with two Bibles and he says, it's got to be in the Word. It's in the Word. <laughs> the Word says. And he just kept bringing it back to the Word. But it was so good because he talked about what he'd learned from Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagen, who were his two mentors, his two fathers in the faith. So he talked about what he stood on. And then he shared with us what we are to stand on for the coming times. Mm. And it was just, I just enjoyed it. I watched it late last night on my phone, but I really enjoyed it. Um, and honestly, he, you saw flashes of Kenneth Copeland's Bible, and he highlights everything in yellow. And there were some pages that were just yellow. Yeah. <laughs> just yellow and David Barton I think it's David Barton he's the one with um he's got the American the, the Bible out with all the beginning of the American um politics and all of that it's just an incredible Bible I wish Australia had one of those but everybody I've talked to isn't interested in doing it um but it's, he said to Kenneth Copeland where did you get your white highlighter because <laughs> there was only a couple of things that were <laughs> left not highlighted. <laughs> but it comes back to the word. You see, if you know what the word is, you've got the sword of the spirit. If you know what the word of God is, it's your shield. If you know what the word of God is, it's the helmet of salvation. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. He is the word. So whenever you open this up, you're opening up a love letter from the Father that he's written to the body of Christ, that he's written to his children. Here's the love letter. Every letter is a love letter. And in that, he's saying, I love you so much. And this is what this is, this is life for you. And I love the New Testament. I'm so glad I live in the New Testament and not the old. Um, but it's just, it's just powerful. And, you know, I praise God that I was born again in the time when we were taught about the Word and the Spirit. Yeah. Are you born again? Get into the Word. That was the first thing. And the second thing was, are you baptised in the Holy Ghost? Do you know that what does the Word of God say? Are you filled with the Spirit? Do you speak in tongues? That was it. And, um, but it was just such a good foundation. And then lecturing in Bible college and then being dean of a Bible college... I was amazed at the lack of depth of study in the Word. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not deep, deep, deep. I'm slightly deep. But the students that came were called by God into ministry or called by God into something, mm. whether it was business or ministry or whatever. And they didn't have... enough of a grasp of the word and sometimes when you ask them you know like whether they're praying they're, I want to know what God's will is or I need healing for this I'd say what scripture are you standing on what is the rhema what is the scripture that God has given you for this um, um all this in there a scripture in there about healing somewhere well yeah there is but that's not good enough we need to know Jesus and we know him through the word and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it comes back to what does the word of God say? What does the word of God say? The first thing, something arises in your, in your life and you need to have like counsel on it. What does the word of God say? And then my first pastor taught me to do a cross-reference. He said, get a cross-reference Bible. And, you know, you get your first scripture and then you follow all the cross-references around until you come back to that first scripture. And then you've got the whole counsel of God on that subject. So out of that, you should be able to make a decision. But it's, it's and, and a lot of, lot of people now, and I'm not speaking down about anybody, but a lot of people now get bites of the word. They watch a bit of a podcast. They watch a bit of this and a bit of that. That's not studying the word. That's listening to somebody else's revelation when we're told to get our own. We've got to get your own revelation. You've got to know what the word of God is saying to you. What is, what is the rhema that God has given you so that you know how to live? Because it will be different for everybody. We all need to know what the word of God says about life, what the word of God says about you know, all, all the different aspects that there's a 
what, what it says about same-sex marriage and what we need to know what the Word of God says about these things. I hope that doesn't go on, on YouTube. <laughs> but we need, to know about, we need to know what the Word of God says, right? But then for every situation we're in, God has a particular word. He's got a, a particular scripture that, will, that is just for you in that. And as you meditate that scripture, as you get into it, as you meditate it, as you go over and over it, as you kind of like chew it over, chew it over and over and, and, and it starts to speak to you, then you in that there's keys to victory. There's keys to walk out what you're in. There's, there's keys for you in that. It's actually God is handing you something that will take you into the next best place, the next you're moving on. This will take you there. This is, your, this is your like almost like this is your, your ticket to go to the next place. But often we get a rhema scripture and we don't really pour over it. We don't meditate upon it. We don't spend time. I know... Um, I don't do it with everyone, but every now and again, I, I write it, every word in that verse, I'll write down one word after the other on a sheet of paper, and then I'll put all the Greek or the Hebrew meanings, and from that I can sort of start to get an understanding of what the depth is, because our English is a very poor language. We use the word love, but there's five different types of love in the Greek New Testament. Five different types, what one is God talking about when it says love? So this is why we've got to study it. And if you want to endure to the end, if you want to stand until, you know, the rapture, Christ comes, whatever, whatever, if you've got to stand to the end, even through situations and circumstances, you need to know what the word says and you need to be anchored into it and not religiously, but you need to be with flowing of the life that comes through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I'm looking for the first way out. However, until then... I have to endure and stand until and there is a nation to be saved, family members to be brought unto the Lord, people to, you know, that have never heard the gospel. I was shocked when I was working, well, was maybe 20 years ago now, I was working at a very interesting place to work at. I was the only Christian in a staff of 80. I was the general manager. Oh, my gosh, four different campuses. And I, I would give out um, leadership Bibles. And I'd say to the people, don't, don't worry about that. Just read the leadership bits, knowing that they would have to read the, the Bible to get the understanding of the leadership bit. And I gave it to one young man who was about 33, and he said to me, what's this? And I said, well, actually, it's a Bible, but it's the best teaching on leadership you'll ever get, John Maxwell's leadership Bible. And he said to me, I thought you said it was only one book. And I said, it is only one book, thinking, where is he coming from? And he said, but there's all these little books in it. And I said, oh, okay, it is one book, but it's made up of 66 other books. And, and he had never seen a Bible before. 33 years of age, had never seen a Bible. The only time he'd been in a church had been for a wedding or a funeral. Knew nothing. Absolutely nothing and there's many many others out there like that but we need to know the word and we need to know that the power of the word cuts through everything that it cuts through darkness that the power of the word is is a sharp two-edged sword that it pierces dividing asunder soul and spirit that it pierces the marrow in the bones it does amazing things and uh, and that two-edged sword means twice spoken once by God and then the second time by you. God has spoken it. You've got the revelation. Now you speak it. Yeah, yeah. That's what a double-edged sword is, twice spoken. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. That I just love the word of God. And every time I open the word, oh, my gosh, to me it's like worship because it's just Jesus. Every, every, it's him. He is the word of God, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word became God, and, but it was all Jesus, and then um, the teaching in, he, in Genesis 1-1 where it talks about the, the hands and the nail in the hands in the very beginning of Genesis 1-1 in the Hebrew, like there's Jesus right there. It's just incredible. I want to learn Hebrew. Not sure I can ever pronounce it, but I would love to learn it. Because, um, but just even pulling it out of the strongs is amazing. And so we get to this book of Ephesians. 
You know, and, and in chapter 1, Paul is just pouring out all this praise to God because of who we are in Christ. You know, chosen, forgiven, accepted, redeemed. I mean, all these amazing things. You've been given every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It's almost like there's so much in him he can't contain it that it's just flowing out. And then the last part of chapter 1 is all about the, the prayer that he prayed, that we would know the hope of our calling, that we would know our inheritance in the saints, that we would know the power to Towards us who believe. So it's about wanting us to know things. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, it's about where you're positioned in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, seated with him on the throne, an ascension. Like you need to ask the Holy Spirit to take you, to ascend you, and to allow you to learn to sit with Christ in heavenly places so that you can rule and reign from that place. It's just absolutely like, oh my gosh, gorgeous, glorious. It's wonderful. It's just like, oh, I love this. You know, and then you're able to look down into your business or down into your family or look down into things that are going on. And you're looking down, seeing from Christ's perspective, seeing things that you would never see if you looked at it in the natural, seeing things that you'd never see if you just spoke to somebody because you're looking down, seeing through Christ's eyes, far above Situ uh, what is it? Principalities and powers far above every name that can be named. So he's saying, This is where you're seated. So we're bilocational. I'm here in the natural, but oh my goodness, am I having fun in the spirit? Yeah. Right? Seated with him in heavenly places. Oh, wow. So awesome. oh, just, and this is Paul saying, Guys, this is the new creation. <laughs> this is who you are. You need to get a revelation of this so that you can live like Jesus lived. Yeah. Because Jesus said, I've come to give you life, life more abundant. He's come to teach us how to live. And he lived out of that awesome oneness, unity with the Father, where he said seven times in the book of John, I only ever do or speak or whatever, whatever the Father tells me. He never did anything outside of that. And I love to get to that place and I seem to be going good for a little bit. And then all of a sudden the unrenewed mind steps in or the flesh rears up. And I think, oh, man. Repent, God, make me like Christ. So you can understand why Paul prayed in Galatians chapter 4, 19, where he said, I travail, I labour with intensity and intercession until Christ is fully formed in you. Yes. And once we're walking in the fullness of who Christ is, yeah. everything changes, like because you're walking as him, in him, as him, with him, him in you, you in him. It's just like this gorgeous mix, like you were talking about in the zhuzh, you know, when, in the prayer meeting. <laughs> it's just awesome. And so we've got this amazing thing. So Paul, get Paul's heart. He wrote the book of Ephesians when he was in prison in Rome. And he wrote this book. And he says, you know, I'm a prisoner of Christ. So he might, Rome might think that he's their prisoner. But Paul says, you know, really, <laughs> I'm a prisoner of Jesus. And that's what we've got to come to, where we can actually recognise. See, the thing is, there are, uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> you can either have fact or you can have truth. So the fact is, Rome had imprisoned Paul. Truth is that he was really free because he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Rome had not imprisoned him. Jesus had. So we've got, the, we've got fact that says the blind eyes can't see, but then we've got truth that says, well, you know, blind eyes can see if Jesus heals them. Yeah. So there's always a fact, but then there's truth. Yeah. And, and fact is a natural thing, but truth is spiritual. And it was, so we've got to learn to go by truth, which is the spiritual thing. And so this whole book of Ephesians is Paul pouring out truth, 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 saying you might think that you are white or you're black. You might think that you're, you know, a Jew or a Gentile. You might think that you're a free man or a slave, but I'm telling you, you're actually this new creation. You're this one new man in Christ. You know, you are this person. This is the, who you are. And so there's this, that this is the truth. And that destroys the facts because facts are just purely natural, subject to the truth. And the truth never changes. And Paul is saying, if I could just want to pour this into you, like I might be in prison and I might be under Rome's thing, but oh, really, truly, how serious do they think they are? I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. And while I'm here, I'm penning this, uh, this letter to the church in Ephesians, right, in Ephesus, that's going to change everything because they're going to get a revelation. They're going to actually see what the mystery 
mystery of God is because the mystery of God was not revealed in the old covenant. The mystery of God was revealed in the New Testament and the Jews thought they knew what it was, but they didn't. They didn't know what it was. They had an inkling. They thought that, um, you know, when the Messiah came, that the kingdom would be established. They thought that there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which there was. But they talk about it in the book of Joel. They thought it was this and they thought it was that. And in reality, they thought that when the Messiah came, he would set up the kingdom and that they would be a light to the other nations, a light to the nations, that according to Abraham's blessing, the other nations, all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham, right? Mm -hmm, But... God's plan is totally different. Mm. And this is what Paul is writing. He's saying, well, you know, what the mystery is mm. now being revealed. It has not been revealed in ages past. This is the first time that the mystery of God is being revealed. And the mystery is that the kingdom is not being established upon the earth the way you think. Mm. There is an ascension taking place where the throne is in heaven and it is over ages to come. It's over the universe. It is that kind of a thing. And your priority is to bring heaven to earth. He said, but the other thing is that God is taking Jew and Gentile and making them one man, one one new body, one body, one body in Christ, one new man. He's taking Jew and Gentile and he's making them one. Well, you know, to the Jews, that was not going to happen, right? They were the Jews. They were the covenant people of God. And the rest of us were dogs, Gentiles, you know, like they had the covenant. But now there's a new covenant which replaces that. And so Paul's saying, Guys, there's a whole new thing that God is opening up to us, a whole new revelation, and I want you to understand what it is, that God is taking Jew and Gentile, he's taking white, black and brown, he's taking man, woman and child, he's taking employers or or slave owners and slaves, and he's making them into one person. The body of Christ, one new man. Like, I mean, that was just mind-blowing to the Jews, It was totally defied anything they ever thought. And then he goes ahead and says, you know what? The Gentiles are going to be partakers of what the Jews are partaking in. You know, you're going to share in the same things. And the Jews go, no, no, that's not the way it's meant to be. But see, but this is what Leah was talking about before. We need to start exploring things in the realm of, of heaven. We need to start exploring what does worship really look like if I allow the Holy Spirit to take hold of my heart and lead me into true worship at the footstool of the throne of God. What would worship really be like if I abandoned myself? We need to examine these things, right? We need to pursue them. Like Paul is giving this amazing invitation and he's saying all the wealth of the riches of Christ are laid out for you but how much are you willing to pursue how much do you actually want and when he talks about riches we think about all spiritual riches obviously but no it's it's material riches as well as spiritual like you know so he's got this amazing thing that he's handing out and he's saying are you going to pursue it are you going to pursue what this new creation is? Are you going to pursue it? Are you going to pursue the wealth of the riches of Christ? Are you going to pursue what you're supposed to partake of? Are you going to pursue these things? Or are you just going to sit in church and accept what's been told you and accept that we sing worship and it's only going to be a couple of songs? You're just going to accept that that's what it is because that's not what it is, right? That's, that's not what it is at all. That's a foundation. That's a starting point. But it's nowhere near what God has for us in Jesus Christ. Oh, I tell you what, if you get an understanding of this, cartwheels around the room, honestly, it is just the most phenomenal thing. And it's like Paul, bound in prison, writing this letter, can't contain himself. Like it's, he's so full of the life of Christ, so full of what God has promised, so full of the mystery that has been revealed to him in this time, you know, that he's been given the stewardship to release this mystery into the body of Christ. So he's so excited, like he doesn't, probably doesn't even see the Roman prison because he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So the first question is, do you consider yourself a prisoner of Jesus? Or as, bond, as Paul said, a bond slave of Christ? Do you actually see yourself as that? Because that's really what is being asked. 
Now, I know we're sons and daughters. I know that we're ambassadors. I know that we're kings and, and lords and priests and all of that. But underneath all of that, what equips us for all of those things is being a prisoner of Jesus. Yes. Have you been so captivated by his love that you can't think of any, anywhere else to go? So captivated by who he is that every other thing just pales into insignificance. You know, one touch from the Lord is so real. Yes. Has he captivated us to such an extent that I could actually get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, let me put... Knowing, going to bed about midnight, knowing I have to get up at three, and here he is poking me at half past one saying, pray. Am I so captivated by him that I'll do that without arguing? Or I still want to say, God, I'm so tired. I really can. Can we negotiate this? But how, how much has he actually captivated you? And not just captivated your thoughts, your intellect, but you, your heart, who you are. How much has he captivated you? We are just the most blessed of people. Yeah. Tell you. So let's just, we're not going to get through all of chapter 3 today. We'll do the first part. But let me just read. This is not the Amplified Classic because it has fallen to pieces. And I did manage to get an Amplified Classic from Kenneth Copeland Ministries, but it's paperback which will last me about a month and there's not enough room to really write anywhere. So this is the Amplified, not the classic. So it's a little bit shorter, not quite as good in my mind because when I'm reading part of it, I know the Amplified classic and I've, I just keep adding the words and then I realise the words aren't in here. So, but anyway, so let me just read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. For this reason... Because I preach that you and believing Jews are joint heirs. See, that in itself is so controversial. You and the Jews are joint heirs. I, Paul, am the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. Assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was entrusted to me for your benefit, and that by divine revelation the mystery was made known to me as I've already written in brief. By referring to this, when you read it, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not disclosed to mankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. It is this, that the Gentiles are now joint heirs with the Jews, members of the same body, joint partakers, sharing in the same divine promise in Christ Jesus through their faith in the good news of salvation. Of this gospel, I was made a minister by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints of God's people, this grace, which is undeserved, was graciously given to proclaim to the Gentiles the good news of the incomprehensible riches of Christ, like there's so much that you cannot even comprehend it the incomprehensible riches of Christ, that wealth which no one can fully understand, and to make plain to everyone the plan of mystery regarding the uniting of believing Jews and Gentiles into one body, which until now was kept hidden through the ages in the mind of God who created all things. Verse 10 is really interesting. So now through the church, through the ecclesia, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects might now be made known, revealing the mystery to the angelic rulers and authorities or rulers and principalities in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. This is in accordance with the terms of the eternal purpose which God carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Our faith gives us sufficient courage to freely and openly approach God through Christ and so I ask you not to lose heart at my sufferings on your behalf, for they are for your glory and honour. For this reason, grasping the greatness of this plan by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, mm 
I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying this amazing plan of Jews and Gentiles coming together. I've got to take my shoes off. But, you know, but it's just like he's saying it is so important. It is so, man, man, he said, if you could just get a hold of this, if you could just understand this. And all of this came by revelation. What would happen to us if we took hold of a revelation that God gave us and steward it the same way Paul dealt with the revelation he got about this? I'm telling you, your life would change completely. It is just such holy ground. And he is saying to you, oh my goodness, he's saying to you, there is so much that is available to you that you haven't touched. So much that's available to you that you haven't even thought of. So much that's available to you that, that is kind of like not even, you're not even aware of it. And he's saying, I know you think I'm in prison. He said, you know, I'm in prison. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disheartened because I am in prison. I'm here for your glory because it's here that he's writing the letter of Ephesians. It's here that he's got the revelation and he's expounding it. It's, this revelation was not known in the old covenant. This revelation was new. You don't find this really in, in the Gospels. This came in the writings of Paul and he said it came through the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit of God. This revelation came and then he talks about it and and, you know, it's just it's so full of who we are in Christ, by Christ, with Christ, of Christ, what God has done for us in Christ. And so this whole chapter 3, it's just a continuation of this praise and the prayer from chapter 1. Just, oh, my gosh, what God has done for us. Yes, yes. What God has done for us. He does not want us to live like human beings. He wants us to live as new creation realities, as Jesus did, who could walk on the water, as Jesus did, who opened blind eyes, who raised the dead. He wants us to live as Jesus lived. And that's, that's the truth. But we think, you know, factually, well, I'm just a human being. No, the truth is you're no longer a human being. You're a new creation reality. Your spirit is now being born again. And your spirit is, the prince, is, is who you are. That's your identity. That's your authority. That's who you are. You have a soul you have part of it is renewed part of it is unrenewed part of it will work with you part of you will defy what you want to do and then you've got a body that you know it's got to just come into line because the flesh will never be anything but an enemy to God right so we've got to learn to live from our spirit so important and he said you can do this like it's so easy Look what God's done for you. Look where you're positioned in heavenly places in Christ. Look, 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 he's saying. It's pouring his heart out in this letter. And so if we have a look at, I don't know where we are. I don't know where we are. God help me. I don't know where we are. It doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. Oh, my gosh. God broke the mould, basically. The Jews thought one thing, God said, no, not really, but that's okay. You can believe that for a little bit, and then when Jesus comes, we'll sort it all out. But God broke the mould through Jesus Christ. Uh, when we became joint heirs with the Jews, when we shared the inheritance, when we become members of the one body, one new man, Jew and Gentile together, joint partakers, sharing in the same promise through Jesus Christ. You know, it, 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 the basis was what the Jews kind of believed, but then God says, well, really, no, let me just change it a little bit because I've got so much more planned for you and um, oh my gosh the earth the ecclesia of God's government on the earth and our sole responsibility really is to bring heaven to earth God's yes. kingdom has come yes. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is our primary responsibility. In that is wrapped up the Great Commission. You know, go and disciple all the nations. Well, how can you disciple them unless you bring heaven to earth? It's just so easy when you start to see it that way. But it says, um, for this reason, I preach. Um, I, Paul, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf. So the first thing is, have we been captivated by Jesus? Has he arrested our progress in life. And then he said, the stewardship of God's grace that was entrusted to me. So there's a, a stewardship of grace, the grace of God upon your life for doing what you've, you do. Like the great, I, do you know how to steward that so that the grace multiplies, so that the grace increases because grace and mercy does increase according to the knowledge of God. And so he's saying it's really important that you know how to steward the grace that's been entrusted to you.
And then that divine revelation, divine revelation that you receive, that rhema word of God is a mystery of God that is being made known to you. And, uh, and we need to get insight into the revelations that he gives us. Insight into the revelation, not just, oh, that was a lovely scripture. That scripture just keeps popping up everywhere I turn. I just keep getting that one scripture. I wonder what God means by that. What he's trying to do is get a revelation into you through that one thing. And then he says that this insight that Paul had in other generations was not disclosed to people. Nobody knew this before. Nobody, not in the Old Testament. They had inklings but they didn't have a revelation of what God wanted to do. And he said, but now it's been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And it is this in verse 6, that the Gentiles are now joint heirs with the Jews, members of the same body, joint partakers, sharing in the same divine promise in Christ Jesus through their faith in the good news of salvation. And he said, of this gospel, I was made a minister. You are all ministers. It is not about who stands in the pulpit. You are all ministers, ministers of reconciliation. Every one of you is a minister of God. And he said, I was made a minister by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Now, in this, in this chapter 3, you will find grace three times. Well, according to the Amplified, you will find grace three times. You will find power three times and you will find love three times. Power and love, power and love, power and love just flows together. You've got to know the love of God so the power of God can be released through you. And it's all by grace. Nothing you can do, nothing you can stir up, nothing you can whip up, nothing you can do in and of yourself except say, God, I thank you for your grace upon me to do what you've called me to do. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your favour. I recognise that apart from you, I can do nothing. Right? I mean, God is just... Oh my goodness, I wish, I wish I could just open up your hearts and your minds and just shovel this in, you know, like, oh, get a hold of this. Oh man, just if you could, because it would just really, you would be swinging off the chandeliers, you know, the holy rollers, really, because it's just the most amazing thing that right here, we are part of one body, one person, Jesus. We are his body, cells in his body. Wow. Wow. And then he's in us. And we're in him and he's in us, like Shane sang last week. Me and him and him and me. You know, if this, this, this union that cannot be dissolved, you are so one with him. Why do we worry? <coughs> Why do we get concerned? Why? One of the things that Sid Roth said <laughs> was really funny because I think Sid's going, I wish this guy would get off the word and go into something supernatural. But that's just what I'm thinking. That's what Sid was thinking. I'm not saying that's what Sid was thinking. But it was just a different kind of an, different kind of an interview. For, <laughs> but... Um, he said, have you, got any, any, uh, have you got something for us for 2024? And Kenneth Copeland said, yeah, have faith in God's word. But what about my family? Have faith in God's word. But what about my finances? Have faith in God's word. And it just kept running it back to have faith in God and in his word. And truly, if that's what we have, what are we worried about? God's word says that you are more than conquerors, that you are uh, always triumphant in Christ Jesus. You know, he said that. So why do we think we're going to be victimised? So why do we think we're going to be beaten? Or why do we think we're going to lose? What's wrong with us? I could just be pointing my finger at me. But what's wrong with me? The other thing is, you know, in Psalm 5 verse 12, Old Testament, it says that the, the favour of God surrounds you like a shield. You're the righteousness of God in Christ and the favour of God surrounds you like a shield. The Passion Translation says that you're under a canopy of kindness and joy. Yes. You know, and that's an old covenant. So whatever place you step into, man, the favour of God's just there. It's your shield. It's working on your behalf. Like <laughs> the favour of God is just at work. Why do we walk into things like human beings when we know better? Mm -hmm. 
Why do we go back to who we were instead of living and pressing forward into who we are? So moving on, because I don't know. So he said, I was a minister by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that our faith is to rest in the power of God. So often people say to me, oh, but I've prayed. I'm fasting. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And I'm thinking, so what? Really? So what? It's, what, it's about what Jesus has done for us at the cross. It's about the resurrection. It's about the ascension. It's about the finished work. It's not about how long I've been praying. It's not, a long, it's not about how much I've studied the word. It is about how much by faith I believe what God has said to me in the word. That's what it's about. You know, so, oh my gosh, it's not about what we do. It's really not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about living with him and allowing him to live in us. And then in verse 8, Paul says, and the power, the power of God. Our faith is to rest in his power. Our faith is to rest in the power of the one who created the universe. You can't get any more powerful than that. And our faith is to rest in his power. So if he's the one who created the universe out of his power, out of just a few like let there be, light, let there be, and there was, and he created all of that, then surely the things that we face are absolutely nothing. I watched something on Instagram yesterday I can't remember who it was by, but it was like a discussion between, it was one teenage boy playing two roles between um, God and Satan. And um, the enemy was saying something about, well, I'm just going to go down to, to earth and wreak havoc. And God says, well, do what you want. And he says, what, don't you care? And he said, you are totally insignificant to me. Yeah. He said, it's almost like a lion, in a, in a, you know, a lion and there's an ant. Whether the ant is alive or dead is totally irrelevant to the lion. Mm -hmm. He said, you are totally irrelevant to my kingdom. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have been defeated. He has been defeated. Let us never forget that he was totally defeated and that we live in the victory of Jesus Christ. Let us not forget that, that we are trophies of Christ's victory, yeah, come on. that he parades us as trophies. Oh, God, please let me look like a trophy and not like somebody's been beaten up. God, but you know what I mean? We, we forget what Jesus has done and we come back to living in the natural instead of recognising who we are in the spirit. Oh, my gosh, you are amazing. And if you, you, do you, do you know that you've all got angels? Yes. Right? I hope you keep them busy. There's nothing worse than idle angels. Because when I went up to the warehouse in heaven, and I, I went up there and God was showing me around and showing me stuff, when I was up there, there were angels waiting for orders. They were waiting. And God said, not many of my people know how to live by faith. What? Not many of my people know how to live by faith. And the angels were waiting. And I met from that point on, I mean, not mine, <laughs> not mine, overworked. I'm going to overwork my angels. I mean, they're spiritual beings, they can't get tired, but I'm going to keep them busy. And do you know how busy they are? It comes by the words of your mouth. Yes. If you speak in agreement with the word of God, your angels go and do what they're called to do. But if you speak in agreement with, with earth, with Satan's words, with, with negativity, your angels are bound and the demons are released or consequences are released that you'd rather not have. Keep your angels busy. They respond to the power of his word. They're powerful. So every day I release my angels. I know my, my main angel. I know his name. So I speak to them. I commission them every day. Okay, go out, guys. I've got borders. You've got a patrol. I've got things you've got to do. I need you to keep me safe, my family safe, get busy. You know, patrol, do a patrol, whatever. What do you need? Do you need anything from heaven? Can I get anything for you? Do you need, would you need new weaponry, angels, what, what, what? But, you know, I'm not worshipping them. Mm -hmm. I'm not worshipping them, but I am using them. Come on. 
because God said in Hebrews chapter 1 that he sent his angels to minister to the heirs of salvation. They are sent to minister to me. So I said, come on, angels, minister. Minister to me. Minister to my family. Minister to my church. Minister. God sent you to minister? Go ahead. I'm not stopping you. I want the fullness of it. Oh, my gosh. But listen to this. In... in I'm not getting this across, but I'm not sure. But he says, I'm, though I'm the very least of all the saints, in verse 8, um, this grace which was undeserved was graciously given to proclaim to the Gentiles the good news of the incomprehensible riches of Christ. Incomprehensible. You cannot get your head around it. But And then he says in verse 9, and to make plain to everyone the plan of the mystery regarding the uniting of believing Jews and Gentiles into one body, which until now has been kept hidden through the ages in the mind of God who created all things. So up until this point of time, nobody really had an understanding that there was to be a unity of Jew and Gentile. So God's plan was, God's plan. And then I'll show you how we mucked it up. God's plan, one family, one new man, one body, right? That's God's plan. According to the world, let me just get the title right. According to the World Christian Encyclopedia, the 2001 version, one body, that's what God is after, one body. There are six major ecclesiastical cultural divisions, six major ones in Christianity, but that is divided into 300 major ecclesiastical traditions, and that is composed of over 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries. So one body, one body, one new man has, because we are so what we are, <laughs> with the unrenewed mind, instead of one body, there are actually 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries. And that is according to the 2001 World in Christian Encyclopedia. There are 22,000 independent denominations. There are 9,000 Protestant denominations. 1,600 marginals. I don't know what they're marginal about. I don't know whether it's marginal, like almost a cult. I don't know, but there's 1,600 marginal denominations, 781 orthodox denominations, 242 Catholic denominations, and 168 Anglican denominations. And all God wants is one body. So from this point on, I suggest that we don't call ourselves Pentecostal. We're followers of Jesus, yes. disciples of Jesus, whatever you want to say, but I want to be part of that one body. I don't want tags or labels um, to separate. You know, are you tongue talkers or are you not? I, I, I just follow Jesus. You know, let, let's come down to the common denominator. I follow Jesus, the cross, the power of the cross, the blood of the Lamb. Jesus because you can see what's happened here God wanted one body one new man which in the spirit realm and what God is working out is what will be but in the natural the fact is the fact is there are over 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries fact truth is what God is bringing about is one man one body one new man in Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. So you can see what the facts are, but the truth destroys the facts. Yes. God will have what God wants, but we're going to work with him. We're going to work with him. So it's unity, right? It's unity. And sometimes it's hard enough to be in unity in the church, in one yes. gathering. Sometimes it's hard to be in unity. I love him. God, I love him. Don't let him speak to me, God, but I really love him. You know, we all have attitudes with people at different times, but the heart of God is 
unity, as one. And so we're going to have to come to that place where we see everybody as one. Every person is so special to the Father. Jesus died for each and every individual. His blood was shed for each and every person. Whether I agree with them or not, doesn't matter. Whether I even like them or not, doesn't matter. I am called to love them because Christ died for them. I'm called to love. Don't always get it right. And if you know me well enough, you know that. But working on it. We're called to love. And doesn't it say in, in, in the scriptures that the world will know that we are his disciples by the love we have for one another? The Father wants love flowing through the, the church. One, one man, one new man, one body, one everything. That's the, that's the will of God. The mystery of God's will is that Jew and Gentile coming together, sharing together, one new man, summing up all things in Christ. But then have a look in Ephesians 3.10. So now through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects is now being made known to the principalities and authorities in heavenly places. The rulers and authorities are to be confronted by the wisdom of God. I don't know if any of you, I seem to be all over the shop, but I know you love me. I'm, I, but I don't know if any of you saw, um, what's his name? Andrew Tate in Romania standing up for Christians. Now he's a Muslim, right? And he's Having, he's, he's on the streets in Romania telling people that you must stand up for Christianity. He's saying, if you don't stand up for this, which was the foundation of, of Europe, you know, the, West, the Western culture was founded upon Judaism uh, and, and Christianity, is that if you do not stand up for it, it, you will lose it. And he said, I'm a Muslim. He said, but I'm telling you, you need to stand up for what you believe in. How much are we actually standing up? Because it's the wisdom of God that comes through the people yeah. that confronts the principalities and the powers. Mm -hmm. It's the wisdom of God that does this. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 says, It's the church's responsibility to release the wisdom of God against principalities and powers or rulers of authority in heavenly yeah. places and show who God is. It's up to us to do that. But we don't take that on very much, really, do we? How about if we started, God, what is your wisdom for this nation? God, would you use Open Heaven Ministries to bring the wisdom of God to confront the principalities and powers over this nation so that this nation would be confronted by the wisdom of God and would fall to its knees? Paul was in jail because he was a rebel. He was in jail because he stood up for something that went against the, princip the, uh, the principalities and the powers in Rome. He went against everything. He's saying, I'm saying, I have a truth that needs to be told. And if it makes you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. tough. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't like it, tough. You, can, you know, he was whipped, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was left for dead, he was imprisoned, but nothing stopped him from speaking the truth. This is what God wants. Jesus had so captivated his heart that he was prepared to take whatever was dished out because he knew that truth would always overturn the facts. And so what I'm saying is persecution is coming to this nation. It might not be very much, not nothing like what they've got overseas, but it is coming. How prepared are you to stand? How prepared are you to release the wisdom of God? Not get caught up in, oh my gosh, I'm being persecuted. But oh my gosh, how awesome. What an honour to be persecuted for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. You know, like, what an honour. So now, God, let me just speak your wisdom that when I speak your wisdom, the multifaceted wisdom of God is released against principalities and powers and they tumble down. Yes. Because the governments and the things of this world, and according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, they are falling away. They are, they are being brought to naught. Mm -hmm. They are being brought to naught. What is God? What, where are areas that you know you need to stand mm -hmm but you're not prepared to, or you don't want to, or you don't think you know the word enough. We need to be able to stand. 
So we need the word. We need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We need the truth of God, the wisdom of God. You know, every day in every way, God let your wisdom flow through me so that it affects the principalities, the powers. Let your wisdom flow through me so it brings to naught the things that have been hassling and, and, and changing the things that are in the world. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know, um, we need to... Conf what, you don't even have to be aware that you're confronting spiritual warfare. You just need to speak the wisdom of God. Just concentrate on speaking his wisdom and let the Holy Spirit deal with whatever needs to be dealt with in the spirit realm. We don't need to be looking for anything, but we do need to be releasing the wisdom of God. And what is the wisdom of God? The word of God. Yeah. Phrased in such a way that the people of the world will receive it. We have some um, people that we pray for, businesses that we pray for that are not Christian. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. They're a step closer. Yeah. But we have to de-Christianise our lingo. Sometimes we have to de-Christianise the way we speak so that the people in the world have an understanding of what we're talking about. I was speaking to that young man I gave the Bible to and I said something about the Holy Spirit and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, I think I'm understanding God. And the way he said it, you know, he didn't. And I think I'm getting a handle on Jesus. But what is the Holy Spirit? And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm speaking a language that he cannot relate to. So I said to him, it's a bit like when you walk through a pub and you don't smoke, but everybody else does, and you walk out with the smell of smoke on you. The Holy Spirit affects us in such a way that it can't be seen, but it can be noted. He's the invisible power of God on the earth. So it's like, oh my gosh, I am actually speaking a language to people that do not understand what I'm saying. Make us relevant, Lord, but relevant with truth, right. not relevant to society. Just know how to speak the truth. And then in verse 11, it says, this is in accordance with the terms of the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So us coming together in one body, one new man, this is God's eternal purpose. Do you want to be a part of God's eternal purpose? Then we've got to come into this unity. And then he says, we have a free and confident access to God. Verse 12 um, in whom we have boldness and confident access. You know, you can come running into the Father's presence at any time. You don't need to wait in line. I don't need to stand behind Sid Roth or Kenneth Copeland. I, don't, I can just go straight, get out of the way, get out of the way, I'm here to see Father. I'm, I'm, I can just go straight in, straight in. Years ago, because of stuff that had happened to me in the past and things that had happened in life, we were in church and we were having this encounter. <laughs> I always left thinking, oh, I wish I'd never gone to church that day. But we're having an encounter and we were supposed to imagine Jesus walking up the street. He's going to visit us in our houses, right? So he's walking up the street and he's turning into my gate and I see him walking up and he's turning into the gate. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you know, not sure if I want him to come or not come. I, I, wasn't, I was a new Christian, so I'm in a whole state of flux. And there's a knock on the door. So in my mind, I get up and I open the door and say, oh, it's you, and I slam the door shut. <laughs> slam the door shut straight on his face, like, oh, and I've shut the door on his face. Yeah. I was so traumatised. <laughs> but I had this, you know, like for a long time, I didn't feel worthy. You know, I felt like I just wasn't good enough or clean enough or, or whatever. I just didn't feel worthy, right? So I never invited him to come to my house again. I never sort of went back into that kind of thing. But then one day I was thinking, oh, God, I just really, really, I just really want to come into the throne room. And then all of a sudden I get a picture of a veil hanging down and it's pulled to one side, like in the middle, like just like you were talking about, the veil torn in the middle. And a head popped out and says, I have been waiting for you. Will you come in? <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> but it's sort of like tentative, you know, because it takes time to grow in this relationship. Mm -hmm. 
We've got a lot of past things that we've got to let go of and, mm-hmm. and the way we see ourselves or the way other people see us has all kind of got to go. But you've got bold, confident access into the throne room, into your father's lap, any time of the day or night, any time, any time. And it doesn't matter who you think is before you because the minute you get there, they're not there. Father's so good at that. He's so good at that. But actually, run in. Like if you're, look, some of my grandkids, not all of them because some of them are cool now, but the little ones, you know, when they come to visit, oh, grandma, 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 and they're so excited, right? And they run to get in, and the other ones kind of saunter in and, hi. you know, hi, grandma, you know. <laughs> Don't bother, you know. But the little ones, they're so excited, and we're supposed to have a childlike faith. Yes. Yep. Excited to be in the throne room, excited to come into his prayer. Oh, Papa, Papa, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. To, oh, he's Papa to me, Abba. You know, but but whatever, but be excited, run in. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to tell you what happened. To, I know he knows, yeah. but there's something about telling him. You know, yeah. I know he knows, but there's something about telling. Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened today. Oh, yes, you would. But I'm going to tell you anyway. So exciting. Oh, can you believe what so and so said to me, Father? How could they say that? Yeah, I, I know, I know. But it's you know, but they shouldn't have. You know, but he's so good. You can say anything you want, any kind of a conversation. You can have a whinge. He loves you. You can have a, 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 a delightful like, oh my gosh, he loves you. Like he just loves you. Yeah. He loves yeah, you. And as long as the communication and the dialogue is happening, he can sort out the bad stuff and the good stuff. He can sort out my heart attitudes. But if I stop coming to him and if I stop saying, oh, my gosh, would you believe what my daughter said to me today? <laughs> would you believe? You know, but he, 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 it's okay to say that because he loves you and it's only in an open, honest dialogue that he can clean us up. And, and sharpen us and make us better or stronger or whatever it might be. you just got to read the Psalms. Mm. David was the biggest whinger. <laughs> my eyes are dissolving with the tears. My bed, just, you know, oh, my enemies surround me. Oh, God, there's no way out. you just got to read the Psalms. David is having the biggest whinge. Like, oh, my gosh, where is this warrior king? And the one who had bread with me, my best friend, he's left me. Oh, and I understand, not making fun of King David because I've got to live with him for eternity. However, there's that little word in the Psalms called Selah, S E L A H. And that's that pause. And after that pause, it sounds like David had never whinged in his life because God had spoken to him. And God had shown him things. And he comes back now with God's perspective. But if he had never raced in and whinged in the first place, he would never have heard God's perspective. What I'm saying is be real in your relationship with Father. You know, as a parent, there are times when your kids are grisly, little ones are grisly, and they don't know what they want, and you don't know what they want, and they're just crying. And you think, I've changed your body, I've changed nappy, I've given you, a, I've, I've burped you, I've done everything. Oh, what's wrong with you? You know, but you pick them up and you hold them because all you want to do as a parent is to comfort. You, it's enough for you that even though they're squ- squirming and crying, it's enough that they're in your arms. At least you know they're safe and you love them and you can work it out. The father is exactly the same. He loves you. He just wants you. Know, there are times when I've said, Papa, I just need you to hold me. Just hold me. And he does. And there are times I can go in and say, I don't know why I'm so ticked off, but man, I am ticked off. <laughs> and I don't even know why, but I know I am. And I know that this is, I, I, but I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> so I'm here. Talk to me. Sort me out. Fix me up. Make me better. Give me a kiss on the forehead and send me on my way. Whatever it takes. But you've got to be honest with him. If we're not honest with him, what is the point of having him as your daddy, your Abba, your daddy God? What is the point? He wants to father you. When the disciples said to Jesus, will you teach us to pray? His first thing was our father. So different to the old covenant 
which is Most High God, El Elyon, Adonai, Yah, Yahweh, all of so different to all of that, it was Father. And now you see in Ephesians, the prayers that Paul prays is Father. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, it's Father. A father of all families in heaven and on earth. And I know that sometimes it takes me a bit, a while to pick up things. But a few months ago, might be a bit longer than that, somebody was going through a hard time. They'd come for me for prayer. And I thought, oh, gosh, Lord, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to look composed, trying to look like I understand what's going on. But inside I'm going, oh, God, I have no idea what to say. There's this just like so much drama and so much trauma and so much going on in so many areas. I don't even know where to start. Oh, God, help. And all I got was, ask me to father him. And I went, oh, I'd never, ever prayed that before. And so I just invited Father to come into that man's life and father him. Changed everything for him. And you know what the Father said to me in my journal later that evening? I love fathering. I love being a father. But we don't often give him an opportunity, do we? So let me just finish with this because I have no idea how long I've rattled on for. So you've got free and confident access. And then Paul says, don't be disheartened. Because he was pioneering this mystery. He was showing us a new way. And then in verse 14, for this reason, grasping the greatness of this plan by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. God, the first and ultimate Father. So every family in heaven and on earth is connected to Father in heaven. If your family is in disarray, Father, would you come and father my family? Yes. Would you come and father my grandkids? Would you come and father me, whatever it might be, but come and father me? Come and father me. That is just one of the most important prayers you can pray. Come and father my family. Come and father my mixed up rallies who have no idea how good you are. Come and father them. Because every family is connected with you. But going back to verse 8, I've got a couple of questions for you to ponder this week. He says, the good news of the incomprehensible riches of Christ. That word is uh, plutos in the Greek. It means riches. Wealth, abundance, fullness, money, possessions, anything that would enrich your life. Anything that would enrich your life. So ask the Holy Spirit to show you how to explore the riches of Christ. What are the riches that he wants you to have for this season? Holy Spirit, teach me to explore the riches of Christ or are you content to stay where you are? Are you content to stay with what you know, like Leah was saying before in worship? Are you content to stay with what you know, knowing that there's more or are you prepared to step into the more? The second one is according to Ephesians 3.10. Are you living a life that poses a challenge to the power of evil. And that's done just by truth and wisdom. But are you living a life that is actually a bit of a threat to the enemy? Father is so, so in love with you all. He has the best of plans for you. The plans that I have for you, Jeremiah 29, 11. Plans for a future and a hope. 
And that's the Old Testament, how much more than you? How much do you want to expand your understanding and revelation of the riches of Christ, of what actually belongs to you through Jesus Christ? How much are you prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to knit your hearts with other people? That is sometimes uncomfortable, right? Sometimes it's like, God, I love them because you said to love them and you put that love of yours in my heart to love them with, but you, you know what? I'm just happy to love them with your love. I don't really want to get that close. I really don't want to, you know, like, I love them, Lord. You just keep pouring that love in and I'll keep pouring it out. But actually having your heart knit together as one, mm. that's a different thing altogether. Because we are one body. We are one body. We're all cells in it. Mm -hmm. And the weakest cell affects the strength of the whole body. But we're all one. And Father wants unity. Father wants a family that's one, where we love each other and there will, there will be disagreements. Say, come on, there will be stuff. I know what families are like. But his heavenly family, there's no division. There's no racial slurs. There's nothing. There's no poverty. We're just as one. Let me bless you. Oh, tithes and offerings, sorry, we need to do that. I get carried away. But let me bless you first and then we'll pray over the tithes and the offerings. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. I bless each, and you are already blessed with heavenly, you're already blessed, but I pray that you would know a greater revelation of the love of the Father, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That the love of the Father, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be so entwined around your life that it is your life. In Jesus' name, amen.